Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today, we are going to have a conversation that everyone knows I spend so much time researching because I suffer from anxiety, but we have Lynn Lyons on. She is a psychotherapist, an author, a speaker, and she's author of the new book, The Anxiety Audit, Seven Sneaky Ways Anxiety Takes Hold and How to Escape Them. She is also in a documentary that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but welcome to the show, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to it's nice to be with you both. Well, this, as I mentioned in the beginning, is, is a topic close to my heart. Mm -hmm. But I think it's close to a lot of people's hearts because it's anxiety, true. especially after the pandemic, just seems to be affecting every generation. Can you talk a little bit about why you think anxiety is such an overwhelming situation right now? Mm hmm. Well, so let me dispel a little bit of a myth is that it was really bad before the pandemic. And talking about anxiety after the pandemic and during the pandemic, really anxiety was like, this is great marketing for me because everybody is talking about the pandemic anxiety. Anxiety had quite a hold on people before that. And what we found during the pandemic is that people who struggled with anxiety and the same went with uh, for depression, is that the cracks became chasms. There were some people that were anxious that loved the pandemic. If you were socially anxious, um, for young people, if you were a child that was dealing with uh, social anxiety, with school refusal, kids that were on the spectrum, they loved the pandemic. So not everybody who was anxious found the pandemic difficult. But what we do know that happened during the pandemic is that people that struggled or people that tend to be anxious, for one, the pandemic gave you tons of stuff to worry about, right? It was like it was like a, 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 a all you can eat buffet of things to worry about. And also you got out of practice dealing with the things that you need to deal with and avoidance because avoidance became sort of what we all had to do. Anxiety loves avoidance. If you ask anxiety what it wants, it wants certainty and comfort. It wants to know exactly what's going to happen. It wants to feel comfortable all the time. And if it can't get those things, then it wants to avoid. So the pandemic was, was really a wonderful place for anxiety to sort of fester and to, to grow because we, we had to do the things that anxiety wants us to do. Yeah. And, you know, you also talk a lot about in your book about ruminating Mm -hmm. And can you talk about like kind of the differences between anxiety and ruminating, but then they also connect. Right. So, so anxiety is the general term that we use that technically describes the physical sensations that people get when they fire off their fight or flight system, not because of a fear response. So when we talk about anxiety, we're talking about, oh, my, my, my body got activated because it believes I'm in danger because this primitive system doesn't differentiate between I'm about to miss my flight and there's a grizzly bear in my kitchen, right? Doesn't differentiate. So when we talk about anxiety, that's the general term that we're talking about. Worry and ruminating are both in the category of repetitive negative thinking. And ruminating, as, as you were just referencing, Bridget, ruminating is the process of going back in time and thinking and thinking and thinking about something that already happened, about something that you did. Did you make the right decision? Did you buy the right refrigerator? Should you have done that? Maybe if you tend to be a, a socially anxious person, did I say the right thing when they when they looked at me that way? Was it because they were offended? Did I hurt somebody's feelings? Worrying is the same sort of overthinking process, but it tends to head into the future more than ruminating. Ruminating likes to go into the past and dig stuff up. Worry likes to pro pro project itself into the future. <gasps> what if this happens? What if I do this? What if that goes wrong? Both of them are equally um, compelling, particularly for women. Women ruminate more than men, as the, the research has shown. And both of them, worry and ruminating, unfortunately, pull us into a really depressed mood. So both worry and ruminating depress us, make us feel hopeless, make us make us get internally focused. So we're thinking and thinking and thinking, but generally not doing much. 
And the problem with ruminating and worrying is that you feel like you're doing some good work. You feel like you're getting stuff done, but you're really just in your own little cognitive hamster wheel, not so not so productive. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who is in that pattern mm-hmm. of either ruminating about the past or worrying about the future? What can they do? I know a lot of people talk about being present in the moment, mm-hmm. but that mm-hmm. can be a challenge for people. What suggestions right. would you have? Well, the the biggest mistake or the biggest fallacy that people have is that they they shouldn't or they should be able to stop themselves from worrying or ruminating. So it, say you say to somebody, oh, you should meditate. They go, oh my gosh, I'd never be able to empty my brain, right? It's busy in there. That's not what meditation doesn't require that you have an empty brain. But people think I shouldn't worry or I shouldn't ruminate. And that's just not possible because our brains are capable of of time travel. Our brains are capable of coming up with all these things. So the trick is, the first trick is to recognize when you're doing it and pull yourself back. So the analogy that I often give is that it's like driving. And when you are little, when I was little, when you guys were watching your parents drive and you're a passenger in the car, you think you're just sitting in the car and they're just holding the steering wheel and pressing the gas pedal. And that's how little kids pretend to drive, right? Like this. But we know really what we're doing is we're constantly adjusting, we're feathering the gas, we're, we're making these adjustments. And that's what you want to think. If you tend to be a worrier or a ruminator and your, your goal is to not do it as much, that when you find yourself drifting, you pull yourself back. And oftentimes just having a little mantra that you say to yourself like, oh, I'm ruminating or, oh, I, you know, no, no need to go there and just pull yourself back. You're going to continue to make those adjustments. The problem becomes when people believe, and a lot of people believe that both ruminating and worrying are really valuable. So they start to worry and they think, well, I'm, I'm really protecting my kids or I'm, I'm going to ruminate about this problem. I'm really going to find a solution that I haven't been able to find. That's not how it works. So the first thing you, you want to recognize, I, I, I say it's, it's the gum chewing of, you know, compared to eating broccoli or chewing gum, ruminating is chewing gum. We want to have you eat some broccoli. We want to get you into more of a mode that I'm going to do something. I'm going to solve this problem if there's a problem to be solved. I'm going to recognize the difference between something I need to prepare for versus something I need to worry, worry, worry for. And then once I recognize that difference and I know that difference, I'm just going to keep making that adjustment, keep making that adjustment. I do this for a living. I've been doing this for 32 years. I worry about stuff. I've got I've got a 24-year-old and a 22-year-old. And when they were 16 and 18, I, I couldn't get through much of my life without worrying about them. So that's a normal part of being a human being. We just want to recognize, is this productive or am I just doing this mental thing that I do that's really not productive at all? Right. You know, in your book, you mentioned uh, someone, a patient of yours that would give that a name. Mm-hmm. Uh, would, yes. And I was, yep. I, as I was reading, I was like, well, what can I do to, to prevent these? Cause mm-hmm. I'll do that to me. I almost feel like I do the worry or the ruminating. It's almost like, um, oh gosh, I've, I've lost like a superstitious, yes. a, some kind yes. of superstition. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. For me. Yeah. yeah. And, and people will say like, I, I was, uh, at a school once and, the, the the moms, the parents that were there, mostly moms generally, but there were dads there too, um, said, well, we feel like we're bad parents if we don't worry. Or when you don't worry, that's when the bad thing will happen. So that's the superstitious, the, the superstitious part of it, that the worry is somehow protective, right? And that's the differentiation that we want to make. I've even talked to parents who have said, well, say something bad happens. You know, my kid totals the car or whatever. And I didn't worry about that. It's not like I think my worrying would prevent them from getting, you know, getting into trouble, but at least I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do. And so it has this way of making us feel as if we're better parents if we worry. 
and and that is pervasive in a lot of different cultures and a lot of different um, uh, circumstances where parents find themselves. So you referred to, uh, Bridget, you referred to externalizing the worry, pulling it out, giving it a name. The reason you want to do that, because it allows you to notice when you're in the pattern. As soon as we get a little distance from our own patterns, as soon as we can become an observer of them, like in mindfulness, you know, Buddhism, as soon as we can pull out a little bit and see that, then it helps us change our behavior. So you give it a name. You can use some humor too, right? You can name it, you know, I always name it Joanne or Sylvia <laughs> or, you know, some some uh, name like that. And then you begin to recognize that this part of you can really show up and kind of take over and you're treating this part of you as if it's your really sage guidance, as if it's your necessary wisdom. It usually is just there to freak you out, basically. Mm -hmm. It's not problem solving. It's there to make you feel oh terrible, right? It's very good at doing that. Who wants to who wants to hang out with Joanne, who's just constantly <laughs> having you watch the bad movie? about how your life goes, right? That's what Joanne wants you to do. Like, come on in, let's watch the horrible way this ends, right? Not a good way to live. Right. So in the book, you talk about seven sneaky ways anxiety mm -hmm. takes hold. And we've already talked a little bit with the ruminating. Can you yeah. mention a few others that take hold? Sure. So um, one of the things that we really want to pay attention to is, as I was mentioning a little bit, um, is, is catastrophizing. So going to that worst case scenario, so you are going to go on a job interview and as you're preparing for the job interview, you, you queue up the movie about the worst case scenario, what's going to happen. And this is where we get sort of that really kind of pessimistic Eeyore type thing like, oh, I know it's going to end badly or gosh, nothing works out the way I want it to work out. And you start catastrophizing. So that's one of the patterns we want to pay attention to, which is why, by the way, I tell when I'm training clinicians, because this is a very common thing that we do, is to say, well, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? And and Joanne, your worry says, oh, I got this. I got this, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, come on in, right? We can have tea and talk about what's the worst that could happen. So I don't, I don't use that phrase. So catastrophizing. The other thing too, we really want to pay attention to, particularly post COVID when we've been, we were isolated, is social isolation. So anxiety thrives, our worry thrives when it's just you and your worry having a conversation. And anxiety and depression are both referred to as internalizing disorders, which means you do the bulk of the work in here, right? There's stuff out there that makes you worry, right? Your kids, your job, whatever. But the bulk of the work is done in inside. There's a, there's a phrase that that oftentimes you hear when people are talking about depression and it says, you are not the best person to talk to you about you. You go inside and you do this. So the more that you isolate, the more that you have meetings with Joanne, the more that you believe your own thinking, the worse this thing gets. And what we know and the research is really clear about this is that when you are connected externally, so when you're doing meaningful work, when you're volunteering, when you're having a great time with your friends, when you're not in your own head, you feel better, you make better decisions, your mood improves, and you just are not giving Joanne the undivided attention that she so, that she so wants. So social isolation, catastrophic thinking, um, and then there's, of course, our crazy busy culture, which I, one of the chapters is about that, is that how do we convince ourselves that being busy is really how we measure our self-worth? Yeah. And, you know, when we, when we run into our friends on the street, how are you? Oh, I'm, oh, my life is so crazy. Oh God. Oh, the kids are so crazy. Oh, I don't have a moment to breathe. Right. And we just think, oh, well, that's, that's how we show our worth is that our lives are crazy and busy. And we know that the, you know, we've all had that is that the more that you put on your plate, the more that you have on your to-do list, the more stress that you feel. And so we really want to pay attention to that. 
And that's a hard one because our cultural, uh, our, our culture right now absolutely rewards that, right? The humble brag. You can't brag about how much money you make. You can't say, oh gosh, I, you know, I just landed this deal and I just made, you know, people don't want to hear that. They're like, oh God. But that you are absolutely allowed to brag about how busy you are. Oh, oh, it's so hard. Look at how busy I am. My kids are doing so much that we really want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And then you also talk about how this can be passed down in families and, mm -hmm. and how this can, it doesn't necessarily define how you're going to be for the rest of your life. So right. can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So nurture is really powerful with things like anxiety and depression because we're social beings. So our kids learn from us. They're watching us. They pick up what we say. They use our expressions, even in positive ways, right? We have these great family celebrations and traditions that get passed down. When we look at the connection between how somebody speaks about the world, how they interpret the world, that has a huge influence on how your kids see the world. And remember, anxiety is like, I need certainty and comfort. I need to know that everything is going to go fine. I need, and, and if you were raised by somebody who talks about the world as a dangerous place, then you perceive the world as a more dangerous place compared to kids that don't get that steady diet of be careful, watch out. So we really want to pay attention to that. We know that genes have a part to play because temperament you know, there are some people who are just really extroverted and there are some people who are more introverted. That's temperament and that's genetically mediated. The more introverted you are, the more what we call behaviorally inhibited you are, which means that you sort of stand back and, you know, there's little kids at birthday parties and some of them are like, I'm going on the bouncy house. And other kids are like, I'm going to watch the bouncy house for a while and see how this thing works. Those are difference in temperament. So if you know that you have one of those temperaments that puts you more at risk, then as a parent, you want to do things and model things for your kids that help them, again, externally connect, move into the world, have experiences. So how parents talk about the world, how they model, how they handle their own stress and anxiety, how parents model connection and friendships and all that kind of stuff has a huge impact on whether or not kids are anxious themselves. I thought this would be a good time to talk about anxiety disruptors. So now mm -hmm. we know some of the anxiety in the sneaky way can enter your life. How mm -hmm. can you disrupt it? Mm -hmm. By doing stuff. So one of the, one of the things to remember is that you can't think your way out of anxiety. You can think your way into anxiety. The brain learns experientially. So if we talk about clinical treatment, we've all heard of exposure therapy, right? So you're afraid of dogs, so you have to be around dogs, or you're afraid of water, so we want you to get into the water. And that basically is effective because this little alarm system that I referred to earlier, that, that your amygdala, that part of your brain, that sort of, that learns experientially. So if you keep telling and showing the amygdala that something is dangerous, it will take that information in, it will store it, it will use it because it wants to protect you. We have to lay down some new pathways in the brain. And the way to do that is to step into the situation, to absolutely accept and even invite the discomfort that comes with that, and then hang out in that situation long enough for your brain to relearn. And so when we talk about experiential learning or when we talk about stepping in, which is a big part of the work that I do, when we talk about the need to expose yourself to the things that make you anxious, the trick is you wanna do it with a plan and an attitude that that says to the amygdala, look, I've been telling you for years and years and years that daddy long legs are life threatening. Daddy long legs are actually not. So I'm gonna, when I see a daddy long legs, instead of saying, oh my God, there's a spider, which it's not even, I guess, a spider truly. Oh my God, there's a spider. I'm gonna say, oh, what a great opportunity for me to hang out close to this daddy long legs 
and let my amygdala get some new information. And it's a process. This is one of the wonderful things that we can model for our kids. But if we say to our kids, if schools say to kids, if therapists say to kids, it's really important that you never get triggered. It's really important that we make sure that everything goes as planned. It's really important that we rearrange the world so that you don't feel uncertain or uncomfortable. The anxiety is like, woohoo, thanks for the help. So the way we want to disrupt it is we want to do the opposite of what the anxiety demands. Now, you don't have to you know, you don't have to torture yourself. And there are certain things that if you worry about them, you don't have to do, like, who cares? If you don't like roller coasters, who cares? I do not like scary movies. I'm not going to go to scary movies. Who cares? My life is fine. But if you are worrying about things that come up a lot, then you really want to model for yourself and for your kids. You want to step in, step in, step in. And it has to be a conscious consistent practice of stepping in with this attitude of, you know what, I'm doing this. I know my worry doesn't want me to. Joanne is there saying like, don't do it, don't do it. Because it's going to lay down some new pathways in my brain. It's going to give me the opportunity to to rewrite a little code in there. Yeah. You, you know, I know another part in your book, you mentioned, I know there was an example where a mother would not drive on the highways or she mm -hmm. did not want to. Then her mm -hmm. daughter moved away and had a baby. Mm -hmm. And I think you talked about how when it get when it doesn't just affect you, it affects right. those around you. Can you share yeah. some things about that? Yeah, yeah. And that was um that the, the 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 stories in the book are true stories, although I change things to sure. disguise a little bit. That's a true story. And this mom was really pissed that her daughter had the audacity to say you know, for one, to move far away and to say, yeah, if you're going to come and visit your grandbaby, then you're going to have to drive, right? How dare. So, so this is the way when we, when I talk about anxiety as the cult leader, that it, it shows up, it makes these rules and it wants everybody to obey the rules. Now, if you're in a family, if you're at a job, if you are existing with other human beings, which we generally tend to do, your cult leader, your anxiety says, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. Everybody has to follow the rules of the cult leader, which is the way cults work. Everybody has to follow the rules so that everything happens according to my anxiety's plan. And when that shows up and when families do that, which they do all the time, the reason they do it is because in the short term, it makes things smoother, right? Okay, so if my kid freaks out when we go to this restaurant, let's just not go to the restaurant. If my, if my husband uh, will only eat three foods, which I did have a client who would only eat three foods, I'm just gonna make sure that we always have those three foods in the house. And if we get invited to dinner at somebody's house, then either we're not gonna go or I'm gonna pack his three foods, right? And that's called accommodation. So the more that a family accommodates an anxiety disorder, the more that a school accommodates an anxiety disorder, the stronger this thing gets. And one of the things, one of the trends that has really become very pervasive, I'm afraid, is this idea that we have to label somebody as having an anxiety problem, an anxiety disorder, I have anxiety, and now we have to put accommodations in place to make sure that the anxiety gets what it wants. So when I say that to people, they go, well, God, why would we want to do that? But people do it all the time. Okay. Accommodations, we put accommodations in place for all sorts of other things that need accommodations, right? If you're deaf, we want to make sure that you have an accommodation in place. If you have ADHD, we want to make sure that we have some learning accommodations in place. Anxiety is different in that the very nature of the disorder means that accommodating it makes it worse. And the same goes oftentimes for depression as well. Yeah, it's, I think you also mentioned that the immediate re, uh, relief, but mm -hmm. in the long term, it's not. I, I'm a former elementary school teacher, mm -hmm. and I can remember a student, I had a carpet in my class, and it had the numbers and the alphabet letters. And there was a number 10 
and it was blue. And I had a student, you know, I, you know, had him on the carpet that he sat down and he was sitting there just crying. Mm. And, and I said, honey, what's wrong? I need to be on the blue 10. I need to be on the blue 10. And for mm-hmm. me with my 25 students, I'm like, do you mind changing? <laughs> because I was like, I got to move on with my exactly. lesson. And exactly. And I accommodated him. Exactly. Yeah. Can, can everybody please just move and let this little guy get on the blue 10? And then his little brain says, I need to be on the blue 10. Now here you bring up another good point. As you give this example, this thing very often makes no sense. Right. So people might say, well, why does he have to be on the blue 10? What is it about the blue 10? Did he have some traumatic experience and all the other numbers and the 10 is where he feels safe? And we do all this analysis and all this investigating. Who knows why he wants to be on the blue 10? But you're exactly right. And that's what happens in families too. Like, all right, we'll just let her do what she needs to do because it's just easier than trying to come up against this. I will say that probably one of the most important pieces of advice that I can give to parents and to people who are dealing with this is that if you yourself have this and you are demanding that other people accommodate you, you are wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. You're wrong. And, and, and what is enormously helpful, the positive, the, the other side of that coin is to just acknowledge it and say, you know what? I've got this anxiety about whatever. I am working on it and I need everybody's help in one, being empathic that I've got this thing that feels really overwhelming at times. And also to know that I am working really hard to not do what the cult leader says. And we're going to all work on this together. I need support. I need encouragement. I need love. And I'm working on it. When I am working with families and the person or the people in the family that are anxious, deny it, won't address it, and demand that everybody else accommodate it. Maybe they don't deny that they're anxious, but they deny that there's anything that they can do about it. Those are the hardest families for me to work with. Yeah. When you own it, when you say, oh God, I've got this thing, right? I mean, I think about another thing. Say you say you had somebody who was struggling with, with substance abuse, right? So, and, and you had a, a family member who was really trying to work on their alcohol consumption. If they say, it's not a problem. Everybody drinks 24 beers a night. What are you talking about, right? I, I, had, a, we, I had a client once, inpatient psychiatry. He says, I don't have a drinking problem. I'm just thirsty a lot. And I don't like water and I don't like soda and I don't like milk. So beer is my only option. This guy was not going to address what was going on. When people say, I'm, I'm working on this, I'm figuring this out. I'm trying to do the opposite of what Joanne demands. You get a lot more support and man, we can make some great progress. But when everybody, (laughs) when you deny it, it doesn't work so well. So now with social media and Mm -hmm. and especially young people, even people my age can be very affected by it. Oh, sure. Uh, You know, we have a social media presence. It seems like if you have some Mm -hmm. kind of podcast or any Mm -hmm. kind of business, you have to have one. Right. But especially young people, but Mm -hmm. also people my age are affected. Can you talk about how that, how anxiety uh, plays a part in that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the interesting thing about anxiety, remember, is that it wants certainty. It wants to know everything. So we have these devices called smartphones that are certainty devices. And the joke that I always make, and you and I are of the same generation, is that way back when, if we couldn't remember a song lyric, or if we couldn't remember who sang, we had to deal with that uncertainty, didn't we? We just had to tolerate not knowing until we could find out. But now the expectation is you're going to know everything all the time. You're going to know where your kids are because you can track them on the phone. You're going to know what, what's happening moment by moment. And that can be helpful, sort of. I'm not a big fan of tracking apps. I'm not a big Sorry. fan at all of tracking apps. I, I read that in your book. Yeah, and, I was like, yeah. and then I got anxious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but the, the problem with social media for young people There's a few things that are going on. One is that you can experience rejection in real time. And that is so painful. I was just talking to a a client of mine the other day, and he was having a fun time on New Year's Eve. He was with his parents and another family. 
the kids were all hanging out together. They were really enjoying themselves. And then on the way home from this gathering, he started seeing where all his peers were. And he was seeing that he wasn't invited to those gatherings. And it made him feel terrible, even though he had had a wonderful time doing what he was doing. So that ability to feel rejection, that ability to compare, social comparison theory, the ability to think that you have to know everything gets in the way of your independent problem solving and figuring things out. Social media is not all bad and it's not going away because it's a great way to share information and that kind of stuff, but it absolutely has its downside. Particularly, I think I see a lot of um, young women with body image trying to differentiate between what's a real image and what's a fake image. All of that stuff is so confusing. And probably my current soapbox about this is that young people are going on social media a lot for, for mental health information these days. And a lot of the stuff that's on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, as it pertains to mental health and diagnoses and all this kind of stuff is not only inaccurate, but it is really harmful and not helpful. I am spending a lot of time sort of digging out of the hole with kids that come in that that uh, that have this information, that they've done a self-diagnosis, that they're sure that they have this th certain thing. They're really conversant in the terminology. The, the, the goal of increasing mental health awareness and all this kind of stuff has had a little bit of a downside from my perspective because the... They 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 are diagnosing themselves. They're taking it on as their identity, and the information a lot of the time that they're getting is just lousy. So it's really a tricky time as a mental health professional to help these young people figure out what's helpful. Not it's also a great way to connect, right? We know it's a great way to connect. It's a great way to share. It's a great way to feel like you're not alone in something. But we've got to help to educate them to be critical customers, more critical customers of what they're taking in. And that's a really, that's a really high bar. Yeah, it sure is. It, and mm -hmm. it's a whole nother layer, something, mm -hmm. you know, like you and I didn't have to deal with, like you said before, Correct. you Correct. know, when we were, and that would have been so hard. That would yeah. have been. I don't crushing. envy. I do not yeah. envy this generation. I don't envy them yeah. for that. Can we talk a little bit about the do upcoming documentary? That's your sure. Anxious sure. Nation, which is a great Anxious title. Anxious Nation. Yes, I didn't come up with the title, um, but it is a great title. So this documentary was, it, it started in, I would say 2018 was the first conversation that I had with Laura Morton, who is the person who launched this idea and one of the, the producers. Um, so we started talking about it. She got my name from somebody else, really wanting to see what we can do about this this epidemic of anxiety in our young people. Of course, the pandemic hit. And so filming changed and we couldn't, you know, all these different things that happened. Um, the film made its world premiere at the Newport Beach Film Festival in October. Um, and I was there. It was really fun. I'm in the, I'm in the film. And then I also did a lot of the consulting for it. Um, and it's making the rounds now, which is all new to me. I've, I don't know how films get <laughs> made or distributed. Or I don't know any of that. I just do what they tell me to do. But what the, the place it is right now is that it's, it's getting the exposure that we want it to get. And I guess there, you know, there's some sort of streaming deals they try to get. Is it going to be on Netflix or this or that? I don't know about that because they don't ask my, they ask my opinion about a lot of things, but certainly not about that. Um, but it's called Anxious Nation. It is it, it follows the stories of several families that are dealing with anxiety with young people. Um, it doesn't pull any punches. It is very um, hard hitting in terms of it doesn't gloss over the struggle of this. And the young people that are in this telling their stories, the honesty of these families going through this is really remarkable. Um, and then it's got a, I, I think, I think it has a very hopeful ending because then we see these kids sort of figuring out what they need to do, which maybe was one of the things that that the filming took so long because of the pandemic. Maybe one of the results was that we got to see, we got to see what happened over a period of time. So I, I think it's great. 
you know, I'm a little biased, of course, but the feedback that I get from other people is that it's really compelling. It doesn't mess around at all. And it's powerful. Yeah. I was also going to bring up, you know, there was a chapter about uh, self-care and self-medication. Mm -hmm. If you can touch on that. Sure. So, um, and if you want to read that chapter, actually, um, Oprah picked it up. So if you go to OprahDaily.com and search for the chapter, you can read it. They they cut, they edited it a little bit, but it's there. So you can, you can read it for free. Self-care. We hear a lot about self-care, right? Self-care, self-care, self-care. Um, self-medication and self-care. Uh, the way that I differentiate between the two is that when I practice self-care, which doesn't have to be in dramatic ways, I really see it as more a long-term pattern. I never feel regret after I practice self-care. I never say, oh, I can't believe that I, you know, hydrated well today. Or I can't believe I went for, I can't believe I went for a walk with my best friend again, right? Oh gosh, what a dumb decision. When I, when you are doing self-medication in the short term feels good, right? Oh, I'm going to drink or I'm going to smoke some pot or I'm going to go shopping and spend money I don't have, or I'm going to eat 17 Oreos. In the moment, it feels good. You generally feel regret soon after. So, oh God, why did I drink so much? Or you know what? I shouldn't have stayed up so late watching that at Netflix episodes and now I'm sleepy and I didn't take care of myself or I skipped my workout. Or So when you're thinking about self-care, think about it more as long-term. It embraces the values that you have. So you say to yourself, you know, I'm an active person or I'm somebody who values connection or I'm somebody who really knows that sleep is important. Self-medication is that sort of like, oh, I'm feeling so terrible. I need something to get rid of these feelings or to numb myself out. Um, and and unfortunately, a lot of what I see labeled as self-care is actually not such great stuff particularly, and I talk about this in the book, particularly the mommy wine culture, that I'm going to take care of myself by drinking. Um, I just think is a really, really harmful message, particularly when we look at the statistics about women struggling with substance use issues, struggling with, with alcoholism. Those numbers are not going in the right direction. So that's what we really want to pay attention to. Yeah. And self-care is that same thing when I was talking about the, the car pulling back into the right. middle of the lane, right? I mean, you, I'm doing this 30-day yoga challenge right now, and I'm two days behind, right? So, all right, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah, I'm two days behind. I didn't want to do my yoga thing last night when I finished work at 8.30. So, so it's always sort of pulling yourself back and seeing the big picture rather than the immediate need to get rid of a feeling or a sensation or, a, you know, an issue that you're dealing with. Yeah. We also want to mention that you have a wonderful podcast and oh, I think a lot of people you. say it very slowly. It's yep. Fluster Clucks. Say that Fluster Clucks. Yes. That's right. Yep. That's 10 times fast. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if people want to check that out, definitely, because it goes into more discussions about a variety of topics and you do talk a lot about children and mm -hmm. young adults. And I think mm -hmm. that that is so, you know, what we were saying about, the um, social media. It's just, it's an area we're not necessarily familiar with because we didn't right. have to deal with it when we were yes. young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the thing about the thing about all of this social media stuff is that we can't keep up. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we, yeah. we, and, and I don't know if you guys have had the experience, but when I'm with a young person and they're on a computer, or on a phone, they're fearless in terms of their use of technology, blah, 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 right? We're, we're much more trepidatious. We're like, oh, if I press that button, am I going to erase something? And they are just all in. We can't keep up. So we have to ask these questions. We have to find out from them and, and, and talk to them about what does it do for you? How do you know the difference between when it's helpful and when it's not? Because we can't use our own experience and our own lens because it's so, so different than theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Thank there's always a new form popping up too. Oh, oh I know. We can't even know. <laughs> and Keep kids, up. Yeah. kids have no problem just pressing posts. And I'm like, did you think about that before you right. go? It's like okay. I read it, read it, I check the spelling. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't that be wouldn't that be a funny thing is to have two people sitting side by side, right? Like yeah. we who who put stuff on Instagram, right? Because of our careers, we have the social right. media presence. My son actually does a lot of my Instagram posts because he's 22. Um, but man, I like pressing that pressing that post button. I'm just gonna make sure 
right? They, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I'm going to make sure the background is okay. I'm going to make sure that the <laughs> words are spelled okay. I'm going to make sure that, you know, like, like I didn't have goop in my eye and they're just like, boop, 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 boop. Yeah, I know. It is <laughs> yep. hard to keep up. Presence <laughs> over perfection. Is what I know. Once, oh. And that, that made, yeah. that stuck in my head. I, I, before I press post, I'm like, presence over perfection. Oh. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, Lynn Lines, for coming on the show today. This was a really helpful discussion that I think a lot of our listeners are going to get a lot and actually probably rewind and listen to again. Yes. So, well, <laughs> you're very welcome. I, I am, I am very appreciative of um, both you inviting me to be on the podcast and all of the wonderful questions you asked because it just made it easy for me to talk to you guys <laughs> about this stuff. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And we will make sure to have the link to your book and the podcast in our show notes. And if you, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure.